and we are recording with lens flares in the background lens a little bit. Flare. Lens flares. Lens flares. Abrams. So I'm in the shot. Wait a minute. I'm not wearing my glasses. Yeah, you're probably gonna want those. Oh. Yeah. So are we both in the shot there? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it recording? Looks like it. Oh no. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, this is Cal Cat. This is Mark's car. Are, are we uh, in the light here? Let's see. Uh, I could probably do a little more. Fill the lighting. Here. Oh. Yeah, you can tell this is this is professional grade stuff. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We have we have the full here studio. In the, uh, studio. Studio. House. So yeah. Well, everybody knows it's a house because they've seen that little <laughs> little tidbit showing the uh, the movie set. Uh -huh. the where all the magic happens. And down there, they're making a mess of it, even more so. Um, <laughs> make sure that'll Yeah, the, the uh, house is in flux. There we are uh, <coughs> building for the uh, Calcat movie. Yep. Yeah, Calcat movie. Uh, in which we've decided to embrace the reality TV generation by actually having them in the house. I'll be playing the part of Honey Boo Boo. Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put on. I'll, he'll be in uh, baby drag. I usually am. Anyway, most of the time. Yeah, with the pretty pony, you know, thing. Shirt. Sure. Boobs. No. Sure. Pretty pony shirt. Pretty pony. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is a recap of, <laughs> believe it or not, yeah, uh, eventually of uh, the convention, Big Wow Comic Fest. Yes, 2013. I, I had done my. Uh, Recap of day one on the previous video, and this is day two. And I was this not is actually a few days that. later, so uh, this yep. is Thursday. But uh, so all the memories have gone about. stale and flat, like uh, yeah. ginger ale left on the countertop. All the snap and fizz is just you gone can be louder. I could be, yeah, but uh, yeah, in any case. <laughs> so this was, uh, yeah, Big Wow 2013. <laughs> we uh, don't have any mics, so like, uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I could project. But, uh, we'll talk to the theater. Yeah, Shakespeare. Uh, so, yeah, the big news at the uh, Big Wow convention was a uh, special guest and highly paid uh, guest star Stan Lee, who yeah. is uh, very much in, in vogue right now because of all the Marvel movies. Uh, and he yeah, was so awesome yeah. that we ended up not seeing him. Yeah. That's true. Uh, because we determined uh, via the admission price that uh, in addition to paying to get into the, the Big Wow thing you then coughed yeah. up like an additional what 100 bucks yeah plus to get in line for four hours he flew in on a plane jumped off the plane and there was already a queue of people in he like ran to the front of it and then they spent like four hours while he collected like you know a bajillion dollars in autograph and then immediately turned around and got on the plane I don't begrudge the man of success but I'm not paying a hundred dollars to wait in a muggy line to get him like to, you know, and I, I'm picturing by the time you get there after four hours, he's not even making eye contact. You walk up and, hey, Mr. Stanley, uh, I like comics and stuff and your movies. And he'd be like, mm. anyway, Bob, so we're going to get sandwiches after this or, you know, whatever. So I was like, I'm not paying, you know, $100 for that. <clears throat> okay, like Garrett Wong of Voyager back in the day. Mm. Who by the time he'd signed so many signatures, it was like two hours later. Oh, yeah, he was just kind of going... So his signature looks like it says "get away," <laughs> which is probably what he was thinking. He wished all of yeah. us would do, and what he could do, like get to the Caribbean or something. But yeah, uh, yeah, you know, back in the day, autographs were a little cheaper. Usually twenty bucks, or sometimes even ten, if it was kind of like a C lister or somebody. You could get a signed mm. eight by ten glossy for like ten or twenty bucks. Now, like the going minimum for like. Dude who was in corridor and background of made for sci fi TV movie, you know, Alien Invasion in LA Part 6, you know, that guy charges like 40, 50 bucks. It's like, ah, oh, come on. If I thought there was resale value here, or if I had any kind of nostalgia for that kind of stuff, but uh, I do have a collection of uh, autographs. Uh, Star Trek mostly. I've got uh, yeah. Clive Barker. Uh, talk about being too tired to, to do it right. He wrote to John, very, he was going to say very best, but he was so tired and, and not paying attention, he went very Ben. So it says, very Ben. Very Ben. He didn't cross the T. So, 
<laughs> is that I got Dario Argento's autograph. He was cool. He he gave me like a big old Italian hug. He's like, oh, I love you. Come hug me. Ah, oh, yes, I signed your movie ticket. <laughs> so I got a theatrical Suspiria ticket signed by Suspiria. Dario Argento. Ooh, I know what the oddity is that I have no idea who that is. You wouldn't because you don't really care about horror movies particularly. Which is pretty sad because I'm not a horror If you were a horror fan, I would say Dario Argento, especially in the 80s and early 90s, and you would go, oh, that guy. Okay, what was he in? Uh, he wasn't in anything. He's a director. He's In his heyday, when he was still making good movies, he kind of doesn't anymore, but uh, his, his sort of heyday was like uh, the 70s. He made a lot of giallos. Those are like Italian slasher movies. And he sort of segued into like supernatural stuff. Uh, Suspiria was his big magnum opus. Deep Red. Um, Deep Red. Which I doubt if you've seen any of these. Uh, he Suspiria did the Animal Trilogy, heard. Four Flies on Grey Velvet, Cat and Nine Tales. Cat and Nine Tales. Um, but yeah, he's uh, for for a while he was sort of like the Hitchcock of Italy. He was really huge. So if you are a horror fan, it's a big deal to meet him and get a big old Italian hug from him. Yeah. So this is, uh, we didn't actually show this picture, it was from the Toy Con, like, two, two blogs ago, but this is, this is the signature of Penny from Lost in Space. She no longer looks like this. <laughs> she has aged considerably, uh, well, she's 60-something now. Yeah. But yeah. Um, let's see from my bag of goodies. So I have heard of some of those movies. Hmm. Here we have, here we have some artist, uh... Oh, yeah, this guy that we bumped into. Pump, pump, pump. Papamil, uh, local did, uh, artist I gather, and, did uh, and, uh, a portrait of me in my Star Trek. Like, hey, can I draw you? Outfit. Yeah, you don't even have to pay me if you don't want. It was like five bucks. All right, sure. And then I'll go. And I'll go. Um, let's see what we got here. Ah. Emma Watson was not there. I did get this post. This, so uh, someday, from the... when she's trying to have like lunch at a little bistro, you can run up. Okay. Shove your way through her bodyguards and say, yeah, "Ever watch inside this?" Yeah, and like, she I, like, like yeah. I did for that Amanda Bynes show. Yeah. Or you could just fake it, forge it, and sell her on eBay. I've got a bunch of the forgeries back there. <laughs> Can't sell them because they're uh, yeah. Here, here is um, he's talking about cartoon pictures. <coughs> All right, so yeah. uh, this is Pinky and the Brain guy. Guy was apparently a storyboard artist on some of the um, like Animaniacs, Pinky and the Brain, and I guess he worked yeah, on some the brain, of the uh, brain, comic brain, books too. Brain. You meet a lot of really interesting people at the Big Wow Con. That's the thing that I think I like about it more than just the dealers' room uh, is all of these really colorful people. A lot of whom have been in the biz for a long time. You know, it's kind of a mix. There's like the new up and coming guys who are trying to get their careers going. Then you got the old guard, I mean, even Stanley, who never even set foot in the building, but... He was in the building, he yeah. was in that one room. That really... uh, oh, that's right, we couldn't get... Yeah, they, they let him into the building, and then they wouldn't let us uh, anywhere we near couldn't. that yeah. corridor, because we hadn't coughed up the $100. But, uh, yeah, so there's like old guard, new guard, and uh, the old-timers are a lot of fun to talk to, because they've been around so long, they've met everybody, they've worked with everybody, and just really strange stuff, you know, like... We ran into this guy, uh, Dean Yeagle... Playboy uh, guy, yeah, he did the Playboy. Yeah, most famous for a Playboy series. Mandy uh, Short. Mandy, uh, sort of naked lady, runs around with adorable little Disney animals. Because he used to work for Disney, and now... That's uh, kind of well, funny. not now, but then he worked for Playboy, so he sort of, like, combined the two. And Playboy was, it turns out, was later <laughs> in the 2000s, and neither of us were reading Playboy in the 2000s. I haven't read a Playboy in... <laughs> it's been years. As I pointed out on my other blogs, like out of the garage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, as I pointed out on the on the on my previous blog, talking about the first day when I met him, the first day, as well as the second day, that uh, that I kind of stopped reading them around eighteen or nineteen because I could. Yeah, now that you can, we both discovered. And that, it's and like, he turned eighteen. We were gonna go get him some. Yeah, stag mags. Like, Ooh, let's go to the Cookie stag stag Mart and get a stag mag, and we did, mm. and it was like the thrill was gone. It was just. Like, it was absolutely dead. It's like yeah, okay, now we're like, old I think I got Our youngest group like, members old you know, enough. I think the guy like, was like, oh, okay, I need to see your ID. It's like, and it's legal. So, oh yeah, I can do this anytime I want. And it's like at the time it was like five bucks. Now it's probably like fifteen to get one of those things. Yeah, and I was like, play with. And, and the internet was just becoming a thing, too, uh, a few years later. So it's like, all right, who needs these things? And it's sort of like when they put up the... Uh, <clears throat> sort of like when they uh, they were complaining about Janet Jackson flashing her boob at the Super Bowl. And it's like, at that point, you could go on the internet, mm -hmm. and you could type in Janet Jackson naked titty, 
And you can find all kinds of pictures of her naked Which titty. was obviously a staged thing. I mean, the thing was a tearaway like, Velcro yeah. boob. Velcro the, for my money, the better scandal was the one that happened a few years later. The Arizona station broadcasting the Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. Right in the final pass, you know, big touchdown moment. Halfway down the field and suddenly this porno starts playing. Somebody broke into the station. Was they were pissed off and they, yeah, they, like, he was a former employee and I guess he had just been fired and that was his way of saying you know up yours to the station <laughs> uh, and apparently all of the people and families in Arizona while he was at it so they all got to see this guy's like it was about like this just yeah, was a John Holmes doing one. a dingle dangle thing and, <laughs> and then he cut back to the football but but also the Playboy guy <clears throat> during oh, yeah, our guy. era had been known for. The General Mills serials. He'd done uh, oh, yeah, he Buzz did a, the Bee um, and The Cookie Crook. I think he General did the, uh, he didn't design it, but he did artwork for the um, Corn Flakes Rooster, too. As well as the Corn Flakes. Uh, so he was a hoot to talk to, and we mentioned, because we were looking at his art style, it was like, you know, I see a little Don Bluth in there, a little Ralph Bakshi, and he was like, oh, I worked for Ralph Bakshi. Yeah, I did and, cool, he did some of the stuff for Cool World, so. Yeah, and if he worked at Disney in the 70s, he probably worked with Bluth, too. I didn't get a chance to ask him that because we were sort of milling around. <coughs> Excuse me. We didn't get a chance to figure out <coughs> who was the model, for, the life model for Benny Shorts. But. Probably not his wife. Probably not his wife. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but uh, yeah. yeah um, excellent artist. I ended up buying actually the one G-rated book that he had. That's how much of a Boy Scout I am. Like he's got this table strewn with like these booby books, you know, like Mandy, uh -huh. you know, rides topless or whatever. I was like, oh yeah, I love the Art Mandy but... Morning one because it reminded me of some Velvet Morning. Yeah, which but had, it was He had no idea what. what he, he should have known about. what that was, but. No. In any case, <laughs> uh, he had this one book off to the side that was an illustrated but Robert Frost man. poem about a cow, and it, being a former Disney guy, he'd drawn this like adorable artwork of this cow, and and I love the poem. So I was like, oh, fifteen bucks, sure, I'll get that, and I bring it over to him, and he's like, oh yeah, I kind of forgot that was there. I don't sell a lot of these. But, uh, you know, I paid my 15 bucks, and uh, while we were chatting, he drew a uh, freehand sketch in the front of the book. So that was pretty cool. And that's, that's just the sort of, you know, cool stuff you run into at cons like this. is like, you know, for a few bucks here and there, you get to talk to really interesting people, talented people. They do stuff like do sketches for you or yeah. just share old stories. Uh, we ran into John Stanley. Yeah, the horror um, con. Well, I say ran actually, into, I mean, we went up yeah, to his table. Yeah, it was, uh, what was it called? Creature Con <coughs> Creature Con 2. Con two. It was called Horror Con 2, but it was Creature Con 2. <coughs> so apparently last year we were at Creature Con 1 without knowing it. Yeah, I guess it's like a recurring thing now. <laughs> but uh, Stanley's got this whole cadre. If you don't know who that is, um, here in the Bay Area, we had a uh, show called Creature Features back in the 70s. It was a guy and, before uh, him. There was a guy, was uh, Ken, shoot, I should remember his name. They talk about him enough. But that was kind of before my time, was the thing. Um, he left it in, like, 1978. I was four years old. I wasn't watching scary movies <laughs> at, like, 10 o'clock. Um, but when he retired, the original guy, this guy John Stanley, took over and ran the show for, like, another, what, six, seven seasons, something like that. And I do, 84. I do remember seeing some of those, because by then I was old enough to stay up and watch. You know, they would show, like, really cheap old British horror movies, or, like, Night of the Living Dead, uh, The Tingler... And uh, these wraparound host. segments was this host guy, and he was a hoot. Uh, their their icon uh, was a skull with a bloody red candle and an eyeball in it, if, if that rings a bell. That was these guys. Um, and, yeah. and he's got this sort of cadre of other... There, there are actually still horror hosts. Uh, no, they're mainly they're, they're all local. They do things like uh, local theaters. They will rent local out Blood and, and do like theater, yeah. yeah, Blood Raw is one guy. Lord Blood Raw. Lord I mean. Blood Raw. Mistress Misery. Mistress uh, Misery was the girl. Yeah, yeah. and so what they'll do is like because they don't have syndicated or shows or even local ones anymore. Uh, it's just not the way the broadcasting works. What they'll do instead is rent these second string theaters for a night, no, no, put up yeah. flyers. You know, okay, we're going to be showing you know Night of Living Dead this night. Horror fans, you know. He does show up and he'll, stuff, he'll do yeah. like live hosting. Yeah, and there's online. <clears throat> but I was just kind of stoked to find out there's still such a thing as a horror host. I had sort of figured it had died out in the 80s. In the golden era, that would have been like the, the 50s. You know, you had like Vampira. And I remember Elvira, but not Vampira. Uh, Elvira before, came yeah. in the um, 70s and 80s, kind of. Kind of around the same time, but on a different channel. Yeah. yeah. 36 or something. Useless trivia. Um, Cassandra Peterson, who pl plays Elvira, is in Pee Wee's Big Adventure as a biker chick. <laughs> so, sans her Elvira persona. 
or in, she yeah. appeared in costume in an episode of uh, recently of an episode of um, uh, the not Pawn Stars or was it Pawn Stars? Could have she been Pawn Stars. And and she walked in. And she's yeah. There was a Pawn Stars one. I think she also appeared on uh, on that Restorations one. She had something for them to restore. Oh, she's probably got tons of memorabilia. Ooh, and, and, and the other one. So that was cool. But yeah, it was kind of harkens, but without going into it again, like my, my feeling about the horror genre in general is that something's kind of been lost. And I know that every old timer, like myself these days, <laughs> says this about when I was a kid, things were better. I'll say this, for my tastes, things were better, you know. And I don't dislike modern horror movies. I'm not like a, that much of a fogey yet. If they're good, they're good. I don't care whether they harken back to traditional stuff or do something new. But there was a certain, I don't want to say charm necessarily, but there was a, a sense of fun in the horror genre. It was fun to go to a horror movie and be scared. And that's something that these horror hosts kind of harken back to. You know, there would be a little bit of tongue-in-cheek, and, uh, you know, however scary there were, there was also a sense that you were having a good time being scared. That was the point of a horror movie. And uh, nowadays, it's not that they're too intense. I think they're not intense enough, honestly, uh, in that what they're trying to do is be, like, much more gritty and realistic, but the stories are everybody as silly as they used to be. It's just now they're a lot more unpleasant. But unpleasant doesn't equal entertainment automatically. So you have, you know, horror movies that are more shrill and... Uh, like the volume is dialed up and a lot of boos jump out at you. And a lot of, you know, <clears throat> just be gross. It's right. a lot of gross. Yeah, I don't, mind gross, I don't mind gross. I love gross, you know. The splatterier the better. But again, make it entertaining. Do something with it other than just make it shrill and unpleasant. Um... Because that's fairly easy to do, and I don't find it particularly enjoyable. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to sit down old school and watch an old Vincent Price movie. You know. <clears throat> Who was actually related to me by marriage, uh, as I found out later. My, one of my, like, second cousins on my dad's side uh, was his wife. Um, and I never got to meet the man, unfortunately, but uh, it was kind of like one of those, Oh my God, really? I was related to Vincent Price, and I didn't even know it. Well, by marriage. By marriage. Mm. Not by blood. Not by blood. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I guess, yeah, part of me is kind of old fogey-ish, like, ah, I wish horror movies. I don't, I don't necessarily wish they were corny, um, like they used to be. But it would just be nice if they were entertaining. Like, I don't know. That's that's kind of a nebulous, vague, difficult to pin down notion. But uh, I don't know. Horror movies just don't equal a good time that much anymore. It used to be like you know, it was a genre. It was like the comedies. You'd go to laugh. You know, dramas. You'd go to weep and like have your heartstrings tugged around. And horror movies, you could have fun hiding behind your bucket of popcorn. You know, and they just don't do that anymore. For my taste. Ew, they tried with that woman in black movie, but they kind of didn't. Yeah, I didn't um, see that one, actually. So we're still start. talking about... We uh, should probably wrap up our thoughts uh, the, on Big The Wild. convention. Yes, um, there were some... <clears throat> well, we were talking about Big Wow and the people we saw. We pretty much covered most of the artists mm -hmm. there. We did not see Henry the Hemp. No, uh, Hen no Henry the Hemp were... was not there. The Ghostbusters were there again. There was a group of G.I. Joes there. The oh, yeah, and a Cobra recruitment station. And, 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 the, and the Daleks, that was Star Wars. Oh, there was, somebody the built a life-size uh, Dalek that looked really good. And they had that robotic R2-D2 that I think mm -hmm. is, is a, is a pro, is I think it's RC or something. It wasn't really to scale, but it was almost yeah. like a little uh, one-fourth scale or something. But it was still cool. Yeah. And, and it's like... um. Yeah, yeah, convention weirdos. We had, we had, <laughs> we had a, a guy dressed as Conan wandering around. We had mm -hmm. a bug sort of. Uh, oh yeah, there was like familiar a looking guy, guy. Uh, maybe Ant Man or something. But he had a package. You could oh tell. yeah, a lot of the guys wearing <laughs> spandex were not wearing underwear. You could tell. Uh, he had there was he a, his man package. There was a guy playing Robin. There was a guy playing Robin. Oh yeah, and, it was horrible. Oh man, he had a oh. Hollywood loaf. You could see everything. It was kind of like... He had a boner. 
Wow, there were chicks with modesty. you know nice bodice walking around. <laughs> that's why they had that show about the <coughs> sexual modesty. But uh, on the first day, but I wasn't um, there for that. But yeah, Robin apparently uh, soiled himself, and he uh, there, his... well okay to clarify, <laughs> uh, I think he had just been to the bathroom and some of it made, dribbled. Uh, he had a little bit of a spot right in the front. Sorry, Robin. Get back to the bat cave. You missed a spot. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, <clears throat> yeah. It was funny how like like the the second time they had a thing on how to design costumes and put on the Facebook. Oh, yeah, that was stuff. actually pretty interesting. And four of the people doing that panel were actually the same four that did the one on sexuality and cosplay. Mm -hmm. So they were doing costuming and cosplay, sort of the sequel. And it's kind of funny because at first they started off by saying. By, by commenting on the creepers in the audience, which I thought was kind of funny. It's like, mm. like, yeah, well, well, if you call your first thing sexuality and cosplay, you're going to get all these kind of off people yeah. who think that it's going to be about... You could use the word sex in the context yeah. of, like, you're German and you're counting to six. Like, you know, and they German would counting off. panel, I explain sex. There. And there would be, like, it would be the most packed show in the house, and all these people would be staring in bafflement at these... You know, mathematical formulas written in German going, ah, am I supposed to get off on this? Yeah, but the costume thing was interesting and in, in how they did the other thing. I thought it was one, one other aspect of that cosplay thing is I think that you can pretty much do your own thing. And that one lady was saying that she thought it was odd that she thought people thought she was odd mm. that she dressed up as a woman version of, of uh, the. Master Chief, mm. but I thought that was—I thought that was cool. It's Actually, like, that's a good idea. Nothing says there can't be a female Master Chief. Yeah, there, there could if be you, a female. If you one. play the canon of the games, it's like why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah. much girls probably like it as boys do. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe a little well, It's probably more enough. skewed more male, but uh... yeah, and, and and although if you make your costume really obscure, like this one girl had done, like a character apparently from like The Walking Dead or something, or or some other random show mm. that, although it's popular, right? But it's, it's like it's so. You know, I'm the secretary from Boston kitchen. Legal. It's like nobody's gonna know who you are. And that's what they pointed out. They said like, <coughs> like okay, you've got the denim jacket and um, the white shirt, but if you were from my generation, I would have thought, oh, you're trying to be the guy from One Day at a Time, <laughs> with the you know, shoulder pads. Mm -hmm. You know, that guy. You know, the guy who talks like this. He's from New York. You know. And that would be funny, but that's not what you were being. Well, it's funny being to our generation, but... You know, that'd be funny, because you'd be like the chick doing the dude. But yeah, we were just but, discussing, yeah. uh, like, now, I've, <laughs> I've never done, like, uh, cosplaying or props or built a costume or anything. If I was going to build a costume, or, well, like, part of one, uh, and this is a shout-out to Disney, why the hell can't I buy a Dale shirt? Dale from Chippendale's yeah, Rescue if Rangers. If you're a child of the 80s... I have the jacket You probably hat, so. saw Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. <laughs> Chip was the one with the small chocolate chip nose. He had the Indiana Jones hat and the bomber jacket. The dude next the to him jacket. with the big red nose, that's Dale. And he had this awesome red sort of a wine shirt, shirt but, kind of a Magnum P.I. thing going on with these that's exactly yellow starbursts saying. all over it. I want one of those shirts. I know other people who want those shirts. I've been to Disneyland and Disney World a bunch of times, and I'm here to tell you, you cannot get a Dale shirt anywhere in the world to save your life. Probably, it doesn't exist. Probably the problem is that Rescue Rangers is no longer on the air, and the niche is just our generation, so they're probably not yeah, a large fan following that would rush out and to buy... That, except if you go to shirts. Disneyland and look in the gift shops, there is a bunch of obscure stuff in there that's like... You know, well, yeah, ties into cats, like cats, obscure, but... you know, early stuff that it's just sort of like some designer or imagineer decided, like, oh, this is neat, I'll do this and we'll make up like, you know, 200 of them and just well, sell them not, here in the shop. It's not so obscure as the, uh, the it, odd um, premise that the, uh, the cat, the white cat from the Aristocats hmm. is a dis an ancestor of the cat, the white cat, and the blonde girl. Being her master from uh, Frog Princess, it's in the same time period, and apparently is that the going theory? I the white cat, and that's why the cat was for sale again at Disneyland when the Frog Princess came out. Hmm. They're all this cat is actually 
like the granddaughter of the cat. From is that the... canon or is that just... Sometimes the cast members like to say things like that. Yeah, they do. Well, they, they, they were marketing the white cat again, so I guess they kind yeah. of said it spoofing, but kind of said it, yeah. Actually, here, we'll sell more. On, along those lines, <laughs> uh, here, here is another non-canon thing that the cast members invented. Uh, mm. But they say it at Disney, so it's like semi-canon. People ask Belle, how come after the happy ending of Beauty and the Beast and the Beast turned back into the dude, how come you're here and the Beast is over there and not the, the girly looking prince at the end of the movie? And her, the, the actress, usually the, the um, whatever the uh, cast member is playing her, if you ask them that, their answer is, oh, because I fell in love with the Beast more so than the prince, so... He, it back. So the fairy princess gave him the magic ability to turn back into the beast whenever he wants. Which is both awesome and kind of kinky, if you think. <laughs> she likes bowls. She uh, into the bowl thing. Exactly. She's, She's like, emotional. you know, you can be the prince like during the day, but at night when you come back up upstairs into the tall tower, you turn back into the beast. So, um... That's semi-canon, because the cast members say it, but uh, <laughs> until they deal with that in a movie. <clears throat> but, yeah, anyway, so bottom line, the Dale shirt thing, well, we'll it's not it. that obscure. If you're a child of the 80s, <laughs> you watched that whole block, you watched Tailspin, you watched Rescue Rangers, you watched DuckTales. And if, if you're my generation, you now Duck have Tales. kids. I, I, I don't, Tales but most people in my age do. Uh, there's a little bit. Uh, yeah. There were two. There were two Rescue Ranger movies, so I don't know whether. Actually, there hasn't there been. was never a Rescue Rangers movie. Wasn't there? There was supposed to be one. It was greenlit. It was in uh, not pre-production, but like pre-pre-production. They were hashing out the story. Of. They made a Ducktales movie, and what that. happened is the Ducktales movie didn't do good, and so they were like, "Oh, scrap plans on that Rescue Rangers movie." If Ducktales the movie had done better, there would have been a Rescue Rangers movie. Uh, the pilot episode of uh, both Tailspin and uh, Rescue Rangers, and I think DuckTales, were essentially feature length. They were like 90 minute long so maybe that's things that they chopped into half hour blocks. That's probably what you're thinking of. Uh, I thought that they went to Australia or something and there was a big deal about the Australia. Uh, that would be the Rescuers. The Rescuers. Ah. Rescuers Down Under, which, since you mention it, uh, Rescue Rangers was originally not supposed to be Chip and Dale. It was supposed to be the two mice from the Rescuers. They were going to take the idea of a rescue aid society and make a cartoon series out of it. That was a little confusing. And at the last, not the last second, but like early into, or midway they through pre production, they were like, you know, we got these chipmunks sitting around, we're not doing anything with them. Can we make it be about them instead and just set it in New York and, you know, have them go on wacky adventures? Um, <clears throat> and I am a fan of the cartoon primarily because of the characters. The cartoon itself is no great shakes compared to, like, DuckTales had way better writing. Uh, and typically better animation, too. Uh, Tailspin was, uh, well, hit or miss. It was odd. R Rescue Jungle Rangers Book was uh, sort of consistently badly written, but I love the character. Another reason. Um, and so, yeah, of, of all of their Disney afternoon shows, it's like, but the thing is, my generation, a lot of nostalgia for it. Everybody, you show, you, if you showed up in a Dale shirt, everybody would go, oh my god, Dale shirt. So it's like, Disney, come on, easy money. Maybe what's I'll going it. on is that it looks so much like the Magnum P.I. shirt that they can't get permission from whatever company <laughs> owns Magnum P.I. It doesn't really look like a Magnum P.I. shirt. shirt. It to looks like it a Dale shirt. Believe me, if it was in that Magnum P.I. shirt, it would be an easy thing to just get one and say it's a Dale shirt. There's no such thing. Hmm. I can get the hat, I can get the bomber jacket, I can't get well, a Dale that, shirt. Well, they can't copyright a fedora and a bomber jacket. Exactly. But they, but they already own the copyright on the Dale shirt. It's their design. All they got to do is make them and sell them in the park. Now, why they don't? I don't know. I've asked cast members, and they, if they know what I'm talking about at all, they all say, oh, yeah, I'd get one of those. So I was like, come on, Disney. Do it. Well, maybe they'll reboot it, and then they'll sell it again. Ooh. But, but, but you know if I they don't ever know if reboot I want it, them to reboot it. <laughs> they would probably make it a wrapper. So it probably would be completely... Oh. No. Actually, I think they did do an episode with a wrap thing in it somewhere. Oy, was it was that a sort of bandwagon they would have jumped on. <laughs> a rapper. Anyway. Yeah, um, uh, yeah anyway, yeah. so non sequitur. Just talking about costuming. I could I could make such a shirt myself, but I'd have to teach myself how to sew and do arts and crafts. No, here's what he, he I figured out what he could he do. He has a good idea. I have a good idea. You get the red Hawaiian type shirt and you get Michaels and you go there and you get the template for the little 
Little, yeah, all you gotta do is get some flower pattern cut out the starburst. And then you gotta just carefully, you gotta put the fabric paint and carefully starburst the whole shirt. Yeah, if you sneeze, you're gonna end up with what looks like a mustard stain. And just put it all over the shirt, and next bake hunt you will have a bake shirt. I'd wear one. <laughs> I would. Uh, I, I would be chip. I'm willing to bet that at least some people would go, oh my god. You're chip and Dale. Chip and Dale. Awesome. But I should be Chippendale, Chippendale. I should be like, <laughs> I should have like the little collar here like this, as well as the fedora, and no shirt. And like a leather G-string. You, know? <laughs> you know, they did that gag on House of Mouse, actually. <laughs> they kind of did it wrong, but they did it. 